It's 2009 and Steve Cohen is watching the financial crisis destroy investors around the world with a big smile. We're down by between three and four and a half percent. Falling about 18 percent. The stock market is now down 21 percent. Why with a smile? Well, while the financial world is burning like ancient Rome, Steve Cohen is living out the dream of every mildly successful Instagram trader. He option traded his way to a multi-billion dollar portfolio for his firm SAC Capital Advisors and he is only just getting started. Cohen is famous for his fast-paced volatile trades and was successful at it for years. But just a few years later, it will all come crumbling down for Cohen as the SEC drops the hammer on him for insider trading. What will ensue will be a Roman Empire-like collapse for Cohen, followed by a revival of epic proportions. But how did Cohen, a once average guy, manage to make money while everyone was losing money? Stephen A. Cohen went from a small-time options trader to one of the most successful hedge fund managers of all time. How did he start from zero and become so successful, including buying the New York Mets baseball team? He founded SAC Capital and started generating some of the best returns out there. And is it all undeserved because he's really just a criminal that got lucky? But how did the king of hedge funds do it? How does anybody make 60% a year? This is the legendary story of Steve Cohen. I don't just want to get into the playoffs. I want to win a championship. There are many dubious actors in the finance industry claiming that it's possible to make millions by trading, so buying and selling different stocks in a short time frame. What is going on guys? 23 year old rich forex trader, we're in a million dollar penthouse. Literally the truth is you could make millions trading forex and I'm helping thousands of my students. What a majestic hookah, truly millionaire style. As funny as this seems, Cohen did find a way to make it work. But the path to get there was hard and full of challenges. Stephen A. Cohen is born in 1956 in Long Island, New York. While his hometown is a wealthy area known for being the inspiration for the great Gatsby, Cohen is not as wealthy as his peers' families. The Cohen family is considered middle class. They live in Great Neck, a once agrarian area northeast of Manhattan. As more people discovered the area, people began to settle. The farms began to give way to some big estates. We are a very, very diverse community. It was a small house and <laughs> It was a little crazy, you know, it was a typical suburban family, lots of sports. Uh, my mom was a piano teacher, my dad was a dress manufacturer. It was a nice place to live. Young Cohen takes up some classic pastimes of future high performers. Yeah, you know, I like sports, so I played soccer, played basketball, and I played golf, and that's what you did, you know, basically. And, and, and the only season I really didn't play uh, was baseball. There's also first signs that he might become a good trader someday, much to the detriment of his grades. I think I was better when I was younger. As I got older into high school, then maybe I didn't study as hard and you know, playing a lot of poker and basically played poker almost every night, which doesn't lend itself to studying. So. <laughs> to Cohen, poker is much more than a bit of gambling. It is a way to earn some side income. Well, the people he's playing with keep losing. And that, my friends, reminds me a lot of this channel, actually, because I am losing thousands of dollars on this every month, believe it or not. One thing that has definitely helped me compensate some of these losses is uh, the Patreon Discord community. Here, every day, I engage, answer questions, send resources, connect you to people from my network or from the community. But, and that's the big announcement, this week is the last chance for you to join it. Starting from next week, you'll not be able to join it anymore because we will turn it into a private closed community just me and everyone who's in it with me i'll still be answering questions we'll talk about career consulting venture capital building side business getting billions and so on but I'm also working on something new and that will be revealed next week. So if you want to ask me and other OGs from the community questions and want to have an open communication channel with me, 
this is your last chance to join either as a gorilla patreon so you'll be able to engage with me and the others in our discord channel or as a bateman patreon if you want to have one-on-one -on -one video calls with me that's it and now enjoy the rest of the video brethren stay ambitious Cohen makes thousands on the felt, truly an impressive sum for a teenager given the value of the dollar in the late 70s and early 80s. Poker is Cohen's introduction to gamble, I mean taking calculated risks, a skill that would translate directly into his life as a trader. And Cohen is not the only finance silverback with a love for poker. Jamath Palihapitiya and Jason Calacanis, two VC moguls we have produced biographies on also on this channel, even went as far as to name their podcast the All In Podcast as an homage to poker. Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day why I love playing poker so much is it really is a microcosm of my own life. You have some skill in that, you know, we have a bunch of starting cards. You have a bunch of other things though that are not in your control. And then there's a bunch of luck and then ultimately there's an outcome. In some cases, it all plays out great and everything happens the way it should and you win. In other cases, you lose. And in other cases, you think you're going to win and you get a bad beat. That basically is life. This parallel between investing and poker and having to make risk-adjusted decisions is a clear reason why you see so many successful people from the world of investing with an appreciation for poker. Cohen continues down the route paved by other young ambitious finance chimps and heads off to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton after high school to study economics. He joins the fraternity Zeta Beta Tau and manages the Fred's funds, making sure they always have enough beer money. For those less familiar with the American university experience, fraternities are essentially selective clubs for guys to join that usually spend their days at university throwing extravagant parties. These frat buddies were certainly helpful in Cohen's life as a young investor too, helping him open his first brokerage with a spare 1000 US dollars. Cohen's focus did not lie in his classes, as one frat brother says. While everyone else was worried that they would not have time to finish a particularly tough statistics exam, Steve took a break from the exam at 4 p.m. to check on his stocks. In short, Cohen's Wharton education combined with his early interest in stocks are the early signs of his potential to make money in the market. And this potential starts to come to fruition quickly for young Cohen, replacing the keg parties of college for a career in trading after graduation. His first stop, Grunthal & Co's options trading desk. Known for its dysfunctional management and an image described as not presentable enough, the firm's dubious reputation opens the door for Cohen to quickly rise through the ranks. Results are put above any bureaucratic promotion letter in this firm, and Cohen's rise would be nothing short of meteoric, proving himself to the firm time after time. During his stint with the company, he eventually makes $100,000 a day, yes $100,000 a day, for the firm. A feat almost unthinkable, unless you're a YouTube day trader. I dropped out of school, no diplomas, no education. The truth is you could potentially make millions trading for it. No education, that's the only thing that's trustworthy about this guy. Cohen, working at Grunthal, does not want to be a so-called Excel monkey only. He wants to get into the driver's seat. It's time for the next step. But other than the people we typically portray on this channel, he does not start a business or invent a new asset class. He continues doing what he does best, but now with his own fund. I really felt like Steve Cohen was kind of a symbol of the time that we're living in. He didn't build things, he didn't inv invent a new technology. He didn't invent a new medicine. He was a trader. And for some reason, we live in a world now where being good at that brings more wealth and riches than almost you know, at any time in history doing anything else. And to me, that was remarkable. Sometimes I do career coachings with people through my Patreon community, and almost all of them assume that the best way to get rich and powerful is to work at a bulge bracket investment bank for around two years and then go to private equity or a hedge fund. But this is not the only way. 
While the era of trading roads was much different back in the 70s and 80s when Cohen was with Grunthal, there still are interesting routes to jumpstart your career like proprietary trading shops. Proprietary trading or prop trading is when a firm gives individual traders access to greedy amounts of leverage in exchange for upfront fees of a few thousand dollars, a percentage of trading profits and or transaction fees. Then the guys get into Ashley Martins driving to the two million quid flat. It's real. Wolf of Wall Street, it's all nonsense. But the money, parties, that kind of stuff, that, that's all real. Absolutely 100% real. Needless to say, some shops are more reputable than others. All in all, there are legitimate ways to earn cash with solid trading strategies with these prop trading firms if one has the discipline, hard work and talent to be successful. And it is an excellent stepping stone for those that want to gain the skills needed to one day run their own fund, like Cohen does after Grantel. Cohen's big move is starting SAC Capital Advisors, his own hedge fund. His success was massive enough at Grunthal that he's able to put up 25 million of his own money to launch the fund. Started by investing legend Stephen A. Cohen, Sat Capital was the most successful hedge fund in the world during the 1990s and 2000s. It achieved an annualized return of 30% during its operation. If it isn't clear already, Cohen is now fully embodying what it means to be a finance legend as he humbly uses his initials SAC to name his fund that would be bound for greatness. Now that he has the skills, reputation and upfront capital to do so, Cohen starts trading in what will be his signature trading style. Fast trades in high volumes with high volatility, chasing price movements after earnings calls and dividend announcements. But as we now know, volatility and risk is not something that scares Cohen. He throws millions upon millions of dollars into Equinix in 2007, a real estate investment company betting on a huge earnings report and the report comes out deep in the green generating 32 percent returns for cohen from the positive earnings call a massive gain on a single trade he also puts billions into RDL Biosciences, a small biotech firm. And biotech is known as one of the most riskiest industry to trade in. Just three weeks later, the biotech firm announces that it will be acquired by AstraZeneca, shooting up the stock price. Cohen makes sensational trade after sensational trade. In his first seven years of managing money, Cohen had only three losing months. The worst, a 2% decline. He consistently trumped the market by trading in and out of stocks quickly. Cohen's strategy was really based around what people like to call an information-driven hedge fund. So he was all about trading around, say, the quarter. Intel exceeded Wall Street's earnings consensus by three Delta cents a share. A loss in the second quarter with revenue. When a company announces its quarterly results, stocks will either go up or down based on that company's earnings. The 52% from a year trading ago. up in pre-market. A new phone coming, a new iPad coming. That June quarter number was scary. And Cohen's strategy was to get as much information as possible, be able to you know, make money either on the upside or the downside, depending on how a company's earnings come out. The question is, is he a phenomenal trader or does he have information that the public doesn't have? So insider trading, which is illegal. It is summer of 2013 and while SAC is going strong, Cohen has a target on his back from the SEC. Several SAC employees have been convicted for insider trading in the past few years and it seems like it is only a matter of time until they come to Cohen too. As he's getting ready for an August of booze-filled fiestas in the Hamptons with his fellow billionaire brethren, he gets slammed by the insider trading charges. So Cohen gets visited by the feds. The feds decide they're gonna go after Cohen. They charged one sort of current and then one former portfolio managers who were, had worked directly for Steve. I think they had a lot of hope that one of those people would flip and cooperate and testify against Steve. That did not happen. Steve Cohen's lawyers went down to meet with Preet Bharara, who's leading the case, and they made a big presentation for the government. Basically, their goal was to convince the government that they could not win at trial. And they essentially said, listen, you just don't have any witnesses who will testify against him. You don't have any wiretaps that show that he knew he was trading on inside information. You kind of have nothing. So they decided instead 
that they were going to charge SAC Capital, which is Cohen's fund, instead of him. By the end of the year, he pleads guilty and SAC pays out a monstrous $1.8 billion fine to the SEC, the largest in history. Failure to supervise is what the feds nail him on. So Cohen dodges criminal charges, but it looks like his hedge fund career is going bust. The trust with institutions, partners and investors is damaged. Is his unprecedented trading run coming to an end? Of course not! Cohen moves on from his failures and makes a psycho comeback of epic proportions. One of the biggest names, if not the biggest, at least when it comes to hedge funds, Stevie Cohen, now unshackled by the SEC after being suspended for two years from the hedge fund industry. He's starting off the new year with a bang as he prepares to open up a new Wall Street firm. From the death of SAC, Cohen's new point 72 emerges from the rubble. This ambitious new fund specializes in discretionary long short, but also eventually adds a venture capital arm along with an internship academy too. Discretionary long short is a highly popular investment strategy too in the hedge fund world, where portfolio managers simultaneously take take long and short positions in stocks in usually similar industries to capitalize on relative over or undervaluation of stocks. It is very simple in theory. They are going to buy a stock they believe is underperforming and is going to go move higher and they're going to short a stock they believe is outperforming and is going to move lower. So the idea is you make money on the short side, you make money on the long side, it's a mean reversion, a double sided mean reversion trade if you like. You're shorting the overvalued, you're buying the undervalued, assuming they're both going to come back to a mean, you make money on the short, you make money on the long. That's kind of in theory what they are looking for. This strategy combined with Point 72's global macro strategy, which is when a firm makes investments based on macroeconomic indicators, sets Point 72 up for its growth to the gargantuan 24 billion US dollar portfolio it boasts today. It seems like Cohen is back with even more success than before and all in a legitimate way too. But he is about to clash with one of the most powerful players in all of the market, a deep state entity with almost unlimited power and influence. Wall Street Bets By turning stock options from a hedging strategy into a glorified bet thread, people on the subreddit have managed to convert the entire stock market into their very own personal casino. Retail Investing Degenerates Silly Cohen bets against the indomitable spirit and unbreakable strategy of the Wall Street Bets militia. Cohen is one of the several hedge fund managers that were heavily shorting GameStop stock, GME, when retail investors initiated the infamous short squeeze. Investing genius Kramer explains how it works. Uh, if this GameStop is really something we must talk about. Wall Street Bets, it's on Reddit. Now, a lot of younger people read Reddit. I read Reddit because younger people read. Now, they've got a community of very rabid investors who will choose individual stocks and then run them up as a group with commentary about how much they love them. Now, they don't target just any stocks. They go after the ones that are heavily shorted in order to come up with a short squeeze and run them until the shorts have to cover their positions. The only thing a short seller can really do when targeted is to throw in the tail. You just have to cover your short, meaning buy back the stock to close out your position before, before you run out of money. Cohen loses around 15% in Point 72's portfolio value, a meme stock play of epic proportions, as Point 72 has significant short positions in GameStop via their investment with Melvin Capital. This fund was a leader, or should we say a big loser, in holding the most GameStop shorts. Does this destroy Cohen's already damaged reputation as a hedge fund manager? Of course not. Retail investing goats always rebound. When the squeeze happens in 2021, Cohen had recently bought the New York Mets for $2.5 billion. His work with his new team during 2021 means the rebuild of a struggling franchise, bringing them to a point of playoff relevance today. 
coming on and being able to do this for you personally, and what is that feeling like for you? This is a lot of fun, right? I mean, it's a lot better than losing, right? This is just the first step. If we can win the division, that'll be great, and then we'll see what happens in the playoffs. I think this is a, a team that can go really far. But maybe even Cohen can't save the poverty franchise that is the Mets, unless maybe he finds some inside information about the Babe Ruth coming out of the Little League World Series, as the team did not go really far and ends up losing in the first round of the playoffs. However, Cohen still pulls off a massive accomplishment in building a playoff caliber team in the Mets, a franchise with significant woes in recent history. While the man has seen setbacks, it is impossible to not acknowledge his high performing personality in always getting back up and making things happen on the biggest stages. Which brings us to the grand finale. So we know we can't let setbacks get us down now. So my self talk is me reminiscing back on the struggle to get to this moment. And that tells me we're not quitting today. Not today. But you might be thinking, what is the specific roadmap that we can learn from Cohen to make it to ultra high net worth status? One route could be taking a course with a proprietary trading firm. A more reliable route could be going to a trading desk or an asset management shop after graduating university. All of that is better than relying on technical analysis from TikTok videos, the finance bro version of astrology science. What nobody will teach you though, unfortunately Unfortunately, is how to manage a baseball team successfully. I guess we will just have to wait and see if Cohen can show us with the Mets next season. In all, learn, have perseverance and use insider info, I mean, invest in undervalued businesses to let your money work for you.